Today's presentation will be back pain, pain, go away, back pain causes and solutions. Today's speakers, the first will be Dr. Kendall Snyder. Dr. Kendall Snyder is a, um, our, is a fellowship trained neurosurgeon, uh, instructor in neurosurgery, and will be discussing many of the points that we are, are ready to move into today. Next speaker will be Dr. Navid uh, Kesri. He also is assistant professor of neurosurgery, inner chair of the Department of Neurolog Neurosurgery, and a neurosurgeon, senior associate consultant, community neurological surgery here in Southwest Wisconsin. He too is also a fellowship trained spine surgeon. With this, I'm gonna turn it over to Dr. Schneider. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mullen, and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, for whatever reason you're on here, we do appreciate the chance to uh, speak with you, uh, especially by Zoom as we're able to. Uh, so for today's discussion, we have a couple learning points for everyone. Um, uh, this is a, a broad topic, so we hope to, uh, to educate uh, both patients and possibly care providers on some general topics that we'd like to hit on. Uh, so first, I, I would like to present uh, the impact of back pain on healthcare. Um, then I'll go over some of the causes of back pain. Uh, next, we'll, we'll go over briefly what is the general workup for back pain. Uh, some indications of when you might seek neurosurgical care. And finally, we'll get into some specifics of surgical care for low back conditions. So first, uh, back pain is very prevalent in healthcare. Uh, it's a very common condition. Over 600 million individuals experience some form of low back pain worldwide. It, uh, it results in direct and indirect costs of up to $100 billion annually in the US alone. Back pain is really one of the most difficult clinical scenarios for providers to successfully manage. Over 90% of cases, in over 90% of cases, the pain is temporary and patients generally actually Actually achieve a full functional recovery within three months of symptom onset. So as the slide demonstrates, there are many causes for back pain, uh, not all necessarily related to the spine. There are certain vascular conditions that can result in back pain. Muscle sprains, strains, or irritation of facet joints can cause back pain. Uh, certain medical conditions can cause muscle pain that mimics that results in back pain. Um, degenerative joints such as your hip and your pelvic joints can also result in low back pain. And then some common th things that we see in the office as neurosurgeons are herniated discs, degenerative conditions of the spine such as spinal stenosis and spondylolisthesis, spinal deformity, traumatic spinal, spinal injury, and spine fracture due to poor bone quality or osteoporosis. So what's the workup for back pain um, uh, that you'll have in the office? Uh, generally, most patients will see their primary care provider first. Some questions that a provider might ask you are, what's the duration of the pain? Where is the location of the pain? Is it all in your back? Is it in your back, in your legs? Is it in your legs only? What are things that make the pain worse or better? Next, you'll have a physical exam. This includes uh, palpating for any point tenderness, testing your muscle strength, testing your range of motion, testing your reflexes, and testing sensation. Some imaging, imaging might be needed, not always. Um, an x-ray may be obtained. Uh, this is a general survey to look at your bones. A CT scan might also be obtained. This is more specialized imaging to look at bone detail. And finally, an MRI might be obtained. This is again, specialized imaging that looks at nerves and other structures of the spine. Again, most patients are generally seen by their primary care condition, their primary care physician first. They might refer a patient on to physical therapy or chiropractic care. They might also refer a patient on to a, a specialist within spine management that might involve medical uh, med medications for your spine condition. And finally, uh, some patients are then referred on to surgery with the above advanced imaging. 
So this is to highlight the care continuum that I just talked about and that at Mayo Clinic, you'll receive uh, really comprehensive care with a wide range of specialists. A lot of times initial evaluation and treatment is again by your primary care or a fa family medicine physician, a physical, a physical therapist or a chiropractor. They might refer a patient on to physical medicine and rehabilitation, endocrinology, pain rehabilitation, neurology, and sometimes neurosurgery at that time. You might then also get referrals into interventional radiology or pain medicine. And finally, again, you might meet with a neurosurgeon. So within this care continuum, when do we generally see patients? Well, we certainly see patients fairly early on if there's pain following a particularly traumatic injury. If there's pain spreading down one or both legs. If there's pain traveling down one or both legs, pain with new bowel or bladder control problems, or pain with unintended weight loss. So next I'll go into some of the management of common back problems again that we see in our clinic. I'll start with uh, talking about what a herniated disc is, and then I'll turn it over to Dr. Kesri to talk about spinal stenosis and spondylolisthesis. So what is a herniated disc? A herniated disc is seen in this upper right-hand image here. You have your bones of your lumbar spine and this blue, space is a disc. A herniated disc occurs when there's a tear in the covering of the disc and the disc protrudes and results in impingement on a nerve root. Symptoms of this can have, it can include back pain. It might also include leg pain with leg tingling or leg numbness. How do you diagnose a herniated disc? Well, first you examine the patient and get their history as I've previously talked about. Uh, advanced imaging is always needed to diagnose a herniated disc and this would include a lumbar spine of the MRI. Non-operative care is usually our first recommendation and with the first onset of pain, we usually recommend giving yourself rest and time. Avoid excessive heavy lifting, avoid excessive bending. Sometimes over-the-counter um, pain medications can help, such as Aleve and Motrin. These are non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. Um, physical therapy after the initial rest is important to recovery. And after these uh, care management uh, options might have failed, then we will recommend steroid injections. So what does surgery look like for a herniated disc? Uh, again, we usually recommend surgery after a minimum of about six to 12 weeks of failed non-operative treatment. And why we recommend the, 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 this time frame is because about 70% of discs and the pain or symptoms associated with the herniated disc will resolve on their own within the first five to eight weeks. I, if non-operative treatment has failed or if there's any alarming signs or symptoms to us, then we proceed with a dis discectomy. This, is remo this procedure involves removal of some of the bone in your low back, in your lumbar spine to access the disc space and remove the compressive disc. This is an outpatient surgery. Most patients usually experience pain relief in the leg within the first 24 hours. It is important to note that discs can recur. I'll now turn it over to Dr. Kesri to proceed with the next two conditions. Thank you, Dr. Snyder. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Dr. Kesri, and I'll be talking about the other two conditions that we pointed out earlier. So the first uh, topic that I'll be talking about is spinal stenosis. Stenosis in medical context means narrowing or tightness. So the picture that we're looking at here shows a normal spinal canal. This is the space inside of the bones of the spine where the nerves are traversing. Now, if we, uh, excuse me. So if you look at the picture on the right side, you can see that that space has narrowed and that's essentially what spinal stenosis is. And it could be due to overgrowth of bones or ligaments and other soft tissue that are surrounding and supporting the spine. So the type of symptoms that you get from spinal stenosis usually are a function of the nerves being pinched. Unlike a disc herniation that typically pinches one nerve, with spinal stenosis, you can get a group of nerves getting pinched, and that can cause back pain, that can cause tingling and numbness in the legs, 
that can sometimes cause weakness and bowel bladder dysfunction. One of the hallmarks of spinal stenosis is reduce ability to walk. People typically notice that as soon as they get up and stretch their backs, the pain may come on and they cannot walk for any extended period of time. They find themselves leaning on a cart when they're shopping because that gives them a measure of relief. When they sit down, the pain goes away and when they get up, it continues again fairly quickly. So once we have talked to our patients and have got a sense that they have that tightness in their back, we proceed with an MRI study. That is uh, the choice study for us to see if there is tightness around the nerves in the spinal canal. As Dr. Snyder pointed out earlier, the majority of back pain problems result spontaneously or with conservative measures. And this is no exception. So a, a number of times we start people on over-the-counter pain medications such as ibuprofen and Tylenol, we help them get started on physical therapy, and finally, it's steroid injections to help with the inflammation that is the root cause of the pain. <clears throat> okay. All right. So, surgery remains the last resort, and if after going through a rigorous conservative measures, this pain does not go away, we proceed with the surgical intervention. And the goal of the surgery is to remove things that are making that narrowness. And that removes that involves removing the bone, removing the ligaments, even if it's a piece of disc that's coming out and causing this tightness. After uh, failure of that conservative measures, we proceed with that form of surgery. And that would involve a laminectomy, which is removing the back bone in the spine to free up where the nerves are going through. Or it would be a laminectomy and foraminotomy, where we would extend our decompression further out to open up the holes where the nerves are exiting. This is a fairly successful surgery and people tend to go home on that same day with a remarkable improvement in their symptoms. So typically this is a procedure that does not involve fusing the back. If you look at the picture on the left, we, we are usually able to remove enough bone and tissues to free up the nerves in the middle. Sometimes, however, the level of tightness is such that we have to extend the decompression further lateral and outwards, and that would involve getting inside the joints on the sides of the spine. And that can result in abnormal movement in the spine and instability. If that is the case, then we will proceed with putting instruments inside the spine to prevent that abnormal movement. And this is a picture of a fusion where we have proceeded with putting rods and screws and locking them together so that the bones won't have any abnormal movement. <clears> then <throat> so that would be a good segue into the spondylolisthesis, uh, one of the biggest tongue twisters, but what it means is essentially a slip of one bone over the other one. Spine is made of uh, a number of blocks of bone that are stacked nicely on top of each other. If one of these blocks is slipping forward over the bone underneath it, that's called spondylolisthesis or just a bony slip. There are many different kinds of spondylolisthesis. The most common one that we deal with is called degenerative or acquired spondylolisthesis. And that is the type of thing that develops over years of wear and tear as we age. The other forms of spondylolisthesis could be due to an accident. Some forms of cancer can invade the bones of spine and cause this. And sometimes it's due to a fracture early on in life that never got a chance to heal. So the symptoms that people experience from spondylolisthesis can be quite similar to spinal stenosis or tightness. And it is because when the bones start slipping, that central canal becomes tight. And that can result in back pain as well as symptoms affecting the legs, including numbness, tingling, and tightness affecting the calves and the thighs. Dr. Snyder pointed out earlier that there are many different things that can cause back pain and finding what is causing back pain can be quite challenging. Spondylolisthesis is one of those unique situations that there is a clear and close correlation between what we see on an image and having back pain. So it is a known cause of back pain without extension of the pain into the legs. So diagnosing it again involves uh, questioning patients, seeing what the nature of the problem is, and then proceeding with some images. Again, CT scans and MRI studies are very helpful in seeing spondylolisthesis, but we also supplement that with getting standing x-rays. And the reason is that a lot of the time, 
that slip becomes more pronounced when the spine is carrying weight on it. When, when you're getting an MRI study or a CT scan, you're lying on your back in the scanner and that weight is not on the spine. Therefore, an upright X-ray helps us see that significantly better. Similar to the previous conditions, we try our best to treat this without any surgery. The hallmark of this is essentially strengthening the core muscles to prevent that slip from progressing or causing symptomatic issues. We can help with the pain by injections. And if all of this fails, then we will proceed with a surgical intervention. So unlike the other two conditions, uh, in spondylolisthesis, there is abnormal movement of the bones in the spine. And treating that requires a surgical intervention that takes away that movement. And that is what effusion does. What we do essentially is putting rods and screws and locking the bones together and allow your body time to build bone around those constructs. So fusion is not something that the surgery does. It's something that your bodies do. And what we are doing by placing instruments is similar to putting a cast inside your body and allowing it to heal itself. So in summary, the commonest issues that we typically see and they comprise more than 90% of things that we, ended up, we end up operating are including herniated discs, spinal narrowness or stenosis. These take one day surgeries where you have the surgery, you typically notice significant improvement in the pain and go home that same day. And spondylolisthesis or slip of vertebral bodies where we typically proceed with a fusion type surgery. And depending on the number of levels involved, people tend to go home in a day or two. So I want to take a couple of minutes and talk about our department and spine care in Mayo Clinic. One of the unique features about our service is access to fellowship spine surgeons, fellowship trained spine surgeons. And what a fellowship is, is that at the end of your regular training to become a surgeon, you spend extra time to learn the nuances of a specific organ or body system. And in this case, we spent extra time learning about all the new progress and understanding that has been developed over the last few years in the field of spine surgery and applying it to spine surgery. We also use some of the latest technologies and that is again, courtesy of the spine fellowship training where we focus on minimally invasive procedures to minimize disrupting normal body tissues we try to spare movement of the spine as much as we can, unless we have to proceed with a fusion type surgery. And finally, given the recent understandings in how the mechanics of spine work, we try to preserve and restore the curvatures of spine that we know are quite important in preventing development of degenerative diseases. And finally, as Dr. Snyder pointed out again earlier, this is a complex organ and it has a lot of things that can cause back pain. So we definitely rely on a multidisciplinary approach to figure out what the problem is, what's the best treatment, and what's the most suitable option for individual patients based on their history, based on their other medical conditions, and what their unique presentation is. With that, I'll turn it back to Dr. Uh, Malling, and we'll go over some questions. Yeah, if we could bring all three speakers together here, we'll we'll do a question and answer session. Um, I forgot to uh, say at the beginning of the program, please submit uh, questions and answers through the Q and A section, and our our staff will do the best they can to uh, answer them. We had a number of questions um, already submitted uh, prior to the meeting, and I'll begin answering our questions with our our speakers or asking the questions of our speakers today, Dr. Snyder. Do, what does a recovery from a herniated disc or stenosis look like, and how long will that nerve pain last? It's a great question, Dr. Moline, and this is something that we're very commonly asked in, in the clinic setting. Uh, so recovery from surgery from a herniated disc or a spinal stenosis um, I, can be a, a mix of a short recovery and a slightly longer recovery. Nerves tend to transmit uh, multiple signals, so signals of pain, such as shooting leg pain, numbness or tingling in your legs, 
and also nerves control uh, muscle movement. All of these things, uh, symptoms, uh, uh, can resolve in, in varying time points. Usually when we do surgery for a herniated disc, if a patient has pain, their pain resolves very quickly within the first hours or day after surgery. If a patient has numbness and tingling due to that herniated disc or stenosis, that can take weeks to get better. Uh, and finally, if a patient has any weakness due to a herniated disc or stenosis, that really can take months to get better after surgery. Thank you for that answer. Next question, could you briefly explain what sciatica diagnosis is and the treatment might look like, Dr. Kesri? Yeah, that's a very good question. Sciatica is a very general term and it involves a shooting pain that people feel down their legs. Uh, if you think of the individual nerves that leave the spine at every level, at every level where you have a disc, uh, these nerves eventually combine together to make a couple of big bundles. And one of those bundles is called sciatic nerve. So anytime you have irritation of one of those nerves in your spine, they tend to cause fairly similar symptoms that collectively are called sciatica. So sciatica is typically caused by a disc herniation as we went over. And it, depending on which disc has had the prolapse or the herniation, treating that disc herniation results in uh, the treatment of the sciatica. Perfect. Thank you, Dr. Kesri. Um, what can I expect from my, uh, my visit to a neurosurgery clinic? How about Dr. Schneider? Can you answer that for us? Sure. Um, so you can expect when you come into a neurosurgery, into our neurosurgery clinic, uh, first and foremost, that we'll give you recommendations that really, we really give our own family members. Um, our care team is very large. Uh, it includes two wonderful physician assistants uh, that have uh, really decades of experience in the field of neurosurgery. Uh, sometimes your visit might include them. Um, oftentimes you'll be seen by a, a, a care provider in another department, such as physical medicine and rehabilitation or neurology. Again, we uh, work very closely with multiple departments to determine what is the cause of your back pain and what are the best treatment options for you. Thank you. Dr. Kesri, can I just continue having cortisone injections in my back? What would your recommendations be? That wouldn't be something that I would recommend, Paul. I think in certain situations, particularly if a patient is not a candidate for surgery, either due to other severe medical conditions or sometimes advanced age alone, we can proceed with uh, ongoing injections as they can afford significant relief. But you can think of injections as a good you know, pain relief, reliever. They don't go after the underlying condition. So we do recommend um, injections as a temporizing measure not too frequently and not too often. If you do end up getting a lot of steroids, they can be causing other side effects. They can affect the quality of the bone in the spine. They can cause a lot of scarring around the nerves that can become its own issue over the long term. Sure. Maybe to uh, offer our first question, Dr. Schneider, um, what limitations can I expect uh, after surgery and how long would these uh, go on for? So really that will depend on the kind of surgery you're undergoing. Uh, briefly for a lumbar discectomy or a lumbar laminectomy, uh, you can expect that uh, for the first couple weeks, maybe about six weeks, we'll have you wanting, uh, we'll want you to do limited activity. Walking is great, but limited bending, uh, limited lifting. Um, after that, uh, it's somewhat on a case-by-case -case basis, but generally around the six-week mark, we start to uh, release patients from the activity restrictions. A fusion surgery is a bit more involved, and in general, then we're looking at a longer recovery, um, and I'd say most of us will recommend about three months of some form of activity restrictions before we start lifting those uh, activity and weightlifting restrictions. Well, maybe to stay on that same theme, and I'll ask Dr. Kesri this, I want to get back to work after I have surgery. What, ex what can I expect from that? Uh, a similar answer to Dr. Snyder's, I would say that it really depends uh, on the type of surgery you had and the type of work you do. Uh, if you're talking about a 
disc herniation or a lumbar stenosis surgery where you go home that same day, we typically require people to maintain those restrictions for a good six weeks before they consider going back to work. But if you are, for instance, doing a desk job that allows you to get up and walk around every couple of hours, then that's a scenario where we could be you know, starting the job in a gradual fashion earlier on. If you have a fusion type surgery and your work involves a lot of physical activities, stretching and bending and twisting and lifting of heavy objects, then we would be a lot more adamant on you maintaining the restrictions until the full healing has completed. Excellent, thank you. Um, I had neurosurgery. Um, what kind of help or assistance am I gonna need at home afterwards, Dr. Snyder? So again, some of that will depend on the surgery you, you've had. For a lumbar disc or a, a lumbar uh, spinal stenosis decompression, most patients uh, really have the hardest time just transitioning out of bed, for example. They say that the tightness of their muscles after surgery is such that they need a little help getting out of bed. Once they're up walking, again, the pain relief, particularly in their legs, is significantly better. So you can, you can expect to be tired for the first couple weeks and for the first maybe two to three weeks, just need help transitioning out of bed. But again, we encourage walking and patients are walking up walking the same day as surgery. Perfect. Thank you. Is surgery my only option for spine condition, Dr. Kesri? No, in fact, if we can relay one message uh, today, that would be that the majority of back pain issues resolve on their own up to 90% of the time by sticking to a rigorous and uh, disciplined conservative course of treatment. A lot of the times, if we manage to strengthen our core muscles, proceed with losing weight to take away that asymmetric loading of the spine, those go a long way to um, essentially treat or significantly relieve the symptoms. Surgery is, as always, a last resort because surgeries do come with their risks, even the most established surgeries, as, success, as successful as they are, we prefer that people heal themselves on their own before we get involved. Yeah, that's a great point. The other thing that I would bring up, um, Dr. Kezra, I'll focus this right back to you, is, is there a weight cutoff or does, would weight loss help me with avoiding surgery or what are your thoughts on that? I think it certainly does. Uh, it's something that I tend to explain to my patients when we have a model up on the wall to look at. But if you uh, conceive or imagine the spine, especially lumbar spine in a teenage um, individual or in early 20s, the weight bearing part of the spine is right in the center of the body. There is similar distance from the skin of your belly button to your spine and your disc as it is from the skin of the back of your body to your spine. So the spine is really in the middle of your body. And as we age, as we gather extra weight, that asymmetrical gathering of weight at the front progressively increases the degeneration in the spine. So any loss of weight significantly helps with that. I have had people who needed surgery, but for whatever reason, were not a candidate at that point and did proceed with losing significant amount of weight and had complete resolution of their symptoms to the extent that they did not want to have the surgery anymore. Well, that's great to hear that there is that option and encourage that weight reduction. Um, Dr. Schneider, does Mayo Clinic perform minimally invasive surgery in the spine? Uh, we do offer minimally invasive surgery for the spine. I would, I would say that I, really it depends on the condition um, or, or the diagnosis of your spinal condition. Not everything is amenable to a minimally invasive procedure, uh, but certainly at the time of consultation, that is something that we like to talk about with patients and offer when it is appropriate. Yeah, thank you. Maybe teeing up or going into surgery, are there medical conditions you consider for high success for spine surgery? I'm going to pose that to Dr. Snyder. Yeah, so I'd say, uh, just as Dr. Kesri noted, um, weight does play an impact on uh, your overall spine health and spine condition. So that's one thing we consider. Um, and really, it's to optimize long-term outcome. The less weight and pressure there is on your low back, either after a discectomy, a, um, a decompression, or a spine fusion, the better your long-term outcome is. Um, additionally, we consider uh, things that risk your surgical healing capability. Those include 
diabetes and smoking. Um, both of those really inhibit uh, or, or prevent uh, good healing of the bones and of your skin. Uh, smoking in particular um, is uh, really results in poor bone healing. So if we're looking at a fusion surgery, we counsel patients on uh, being off of all nicotine containing prog products for uh, many weeks prior to surgery. Um, finally, I, we do oftentimes, uh, predominantly for fusion surgeries, get a bone mineral density or evaluate your bone integrity. Um, this is important because when we're putting fixation rods and screws into bone, um, obviously screws going into hard bone uh, versus drywall are going to have more long-term success. Uh, so a lot of times we'll get a bone mineral density to optimize your bone quality. Many times we'll have patients get treated for bone poor bone quality prior to a fusion surgery. Yeah, excellent. Thank you. <clears throat> there are a number of questions surrounding medication, but a lot of them are coming up around uh, a Neurontin or a medication called gabapentin. Are they effective? Would you recommend them? How do you feel about them, Dr. Schneider? Yeah, so um, broadly, gabapentin can help with a number of uh, um, compressive uh, uh, spinal conditions, such as pressure of a disc on a single nerve or pressure on multiple nerves from spinal stenosis. Um, so I, I do oftentimes see patients get benefit from them. Uh, I do see that we have someone in the audience who's asked a bit about gabapentin. I would say uh, certainly it does work well for some patients, but I agree uh, one of the most significant side effects uh, brought up by, by this um, attendee is uh, it makes patients drowsy. And that's one of the indications to uh, consider alternative managements um, uh, for your spinal condition. I've had patients who uh, can't function well when it makes them drowsy. And so we look at taking them off of the medication uh, before then potentially proceeding with surgery. Sure, sure. Dr. Kesri, a question that always is posed to me, um, particularly in my clinic, but I'm going to let you answer this. Should I bed rest when I have uh, back pain? Is it a good treatment for it? Um, it's a very good question. I think in the acute phase of the disease, meaning that first couple of days when you have a disc pop and you have that devastating burning pain shooting down the leg, it might be helpful to rest a little bit. But generally speaking, once the pain is somewhat under control, we recommend against resting. We prefer people walk in moderate amounts, but frequent amounts and uh, avoid the conditioning and uh, loss of muscle strength that supports the spine by just resting. Thank you. Kind of on that similar note, um, you know, I've had this back pain. I know we addressed it a little bit in the uh, um, talk, but when should I seek treatment for that neck or back pain? Is there a time frame I should wait or when should I go in? Dr. Snyder, do you wish to answer this for us, please? Yeah, sure. Uh, so for low back pain, again, generally we recommend patients uh, spend about six to 12 weeks undergoing some sort of conservative management. And conservative doesn't mean that you're not uh, being treated for the condition. Uh, it's somewhat of a misnomer. What we mean by conservative management is um, uh, not uh, surgical intervention. So that involves things like resting initially to allow the acute inflammation, the immediate inflammation to calm down, then being somewhat physically active, not active to the point that you're uh, undergoing or having severe pain, but being active up until the point until you have a little bit of uh, intolerance uh, and pushing through some of that. Um, uh, so generally we recommend waiting about six to 12 weeks before uh, seeking a higher level of treatment um, uh, and then, uh, and then going on to potentially surgical uh, discussion as necessary. Sure. I'm going to pose this question to uh, Dr. Kesri. When do you feel a fusion is appropriate? Excellent question. And this is a question that comes up quite routinely. So uh, on a general level, when we consider spine-related causes of pain, it's either because a nerve is getting pinched or because we have significant degeneration in the spine that has resulted in abnormal movement, just as was the case with spondylolisthesis. If the main source of pain is nerve compression, the goal of the surgery is to free up the nerves. And if that involves removing enough bone that that would result in abnormal movement of the spine, let's say by removing too much of a joint, then we will have to fuse that uh, segment to prevent it from getting worse and cause more pain. 
And of course, in the case of spondyloelasthesis, where abnormal movement is the problem, then the fusion is the surgery of choice. These surgeries are actually quite successful in uh, re relieving people of their pain and uh, neurological deficits. Unlike some of the, of a, some, a bit of a misnomer that they have, I think they are quite successful in properly selected patients. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Schneider, um, when I'm seen in my primary care setting, uh, they've evaluated my back pain. Um, are there significant questions or particular questions or physical examination that your office would perform that would help highlight that I need surgery or surgery is indicated? You know, it's a great question. I think we really receive excellent referrals from our primary care providers. Um, as we've said in this uh, presentation, back pain is really hard to diagnose and manage. Um, there's usually not, uh, or there's not necessarily one cause of back pain, and many conditions can cause back pain. So I, I think our primary care providers do an excellent job of uh, working up patients. I'd say the most helpful thing for us is uh, having some sort of imaging going into the appointment. Um, uh, X-rays are certainly helpful to look at the bony anatomy, and MRI is really critical to look if there's any uh, to look to see if there's any pressure on nerves. Um, uh, and again, a CT scan is occasionally an advanced image that uh, we need to look at uh, bony detail. So, thank you, um, Dr. Kesri. Are there certain things I should not do if I have back pain prior to surgery? Uh, um, I think a lot of it comes down to letting your body be in your guide. If certain activities is causing more discomfort and pain, particularly if it results in numbness and tingling coming on or weakness getting worse, those are the things that you want to avoid. And as we went over earlier, you also want to avoid resting uh, for prolonged periods of time. We encourage moderate and frequent amount of activity, as I pointed out earlier, to make sure that uh, you know the spine doesn't lose its muscular support and at the same time the damaged tissue is not aggravated too much by activities such as continuing with physical workout activities or running and things of that nature. Thank you. Uh, another question states, how long do I, is it expected to stay in the hospital after I have neurosurgery or spine surgery? Yeah. Um, so again, this will vary on a case-to-case -case basis, um, I, but certainly for our uh, somewhat smaller procedures, such as lumbar discectomies or lumbar laminectomies, uh, we're looking at oftentimes the same day procedure. Uh, definitely for lumbar discectomies, patients come in early in the morning, undergo surgery, and they're able to go home uh, the same evening. Um, lumbar laminectomies sometimes are same, same day or an overnight surgery. Um, we oftentimes tell patients that the incision, while it uh, tends to not uh, be particularly pain limiting, you will have incision pain, and we definitely help you with that while you're in the hospital receiving daycare or overnight care. Our goal is to get you to a point where the incision pain is tolerable that you can get around the house, and I would say the majority of our patients find that to be the case, that they can get up after surgery, uh, get around to their, their restroom in their house or their kitchen. Um, uh, so really that's our goal to get you home as quickly as possible, uh, but really also as safely as possible. Thank you. Maybe a twofold question here, Dr. Kesri. Uh, one, how does steroid injections work and how long can I expect them to work for? Okay. So steroids are the endemic or in the, the way that our bodies fight inflammation. That's, uh, the, that's why our bodies naturally make steroids. And in the case of nerves, when they get damaged, they get inflamed. Just as when you hit your hand against a wall or you have an accident, that organ or in that part of your body gets swollen and gets angry and painful, the same thing happens with the nerves. And steroids as anti-inflammatory medication helps settling that inflammation. So a lot of the times that process is self-limiting and that's why we promote a, a conservative measure before we proceed with any surgical intervention. Steroids help you get through that healing phase by controlling the inflammation and the pain. Um, how many of the steroid shots you can get and how long the effect lasts, those are also good questions and reliable answers. Typically, an ster a steroid shot tends to work for a three-month period. In some people, it doesn't work at all. And in some people, it can work 
just the one shot because that's all it takes for you to get through that inflammatory phase. Um, I don't recommend uh, ongoing steroid uh, shots beyond two years as it will continue to build up its side effects and cause scar tissue around the nerves without much added benefit. Thank you. Dr. Schneider, are there any new technologies in spinal fusion that we should be aware of? Uh, yes, there are a number of new technologies in spinal fusion, many of which focus on uh, the minimally evasive approach to the spine. Um, uh, sometimes these approaches are appropriate for spinal fusion surgery. Uh, sometimes we, uh, uh, we use more traditional uh, approaches uh, to the lumbar spine for spinal fusion surgery. So things like there are options with, um, uh, some people may have heard of a robot to help with placement of uh, screws as part of spinal fusion surgery. Surgery. Um, there are minimally invasive approaches with small incisions to uh, proceed with a spinal fusion surgery. Um, additionally, something that uh, is fairly new is uh, are the ways to augment spinal fusion. And by that, I mean, as Dr. Kesri spoke, uh, the fusion is, is somewhat of a two-part procedure. Um, we put uh, rods and screws into bone to fixate the bone, but then really we, we, we rely on your bone building up and fusing together uh, long-term to uh, provide stability to that region. And there are um, uh, fairly new uh, materials that we can use in place over the bone to help optimize the, the bony spinal fusion long-term. Thank you. Um, we have a few more questions left here and I'll ask them and then uh, we'll conclude our program here in just uh, about 515. Um, how does the SI joint impact um, and confuse the picture when it comes to pain? SI joint being sacroiliac spine or sacroiliac joint. So Dr. Schneider, Dr. Kesri, can you address that for us? Yeah, so SI joint is a very important joint. It's a joint that naturally is not very mobile. It's a joint that connects your spine to your lower trunk, your pelvis. And a lot of the time, pain in the SI joint can result in back pain. And all of the body being an interconnected system, if you have an ongoing SI joint problem for a while, it will start affecting the lumbar spine and your hip joints as well. And in that way, if you leave it untreated, you will end up having problems in other joints. One of the best ways to discriminate between a side joint versus other etiologies of back pain is injection of steroids in an SI joint. It's a very successful test and therapy for pain that comes from a side joints. Usually we start by taking x-rays that tend to show a significant amount of degeneration in one or both of the side joints. There are maneuvers that we do during the physical examination to put stress on that joint. And if it is a joint that has disease, that will reproduce the pain that people normally complain about with that disease. And then we'll send them for an injection. And based on that, we can uh, conclude whether it's the side joint that's the problem or some other uh, part of the body. Thank you for that great answer. Uh, we're gonna conclude with one last question. It may be a little bit um, difficult to answer, but. Oftentimes people tell me um, they feel great after surgery, but they also tell me it's the last thing I should do. Dr. Schneider, can you address that? Yeah, I'd be happy to. So I certainly I think of my job as my hobby. I've been trained to do this and I absolutely love to perform surgery. Um, it gives me a lot of uh, gratification to see my patients do well. Um, but also if you don't need surgery, then, uh, you know, that's, that's also great. Um, uh, so many of the spinal conditions that we see do very well with conservative management. And that can be, as we've said, some activity modification, um, uh, that can be over-the-counter medications, physical therapy, uh, sometimes injections. Uh, I also look to it as a, res a last resor resort, unless there's something really compromising uh, your neurologic function, uh, in which case then I'll tend to tell patients, uh, you know, uh, depending on their symptoms, you may warrant surgery sooner rather than later. Thank you. Well, that'll uh, uh, end our program for today. Thank you, Dr. Schneider, and thank you, Dr. Kesari, for, for uh, uh, presenting today. And thank you for all our guests who have joined us.